So a culture of commitment is built when people come together of like mind. And in our case, when we come together around Jesus, his church and the, and the Great Commission. Christ, the church and his cause. What I want to do is help us understand this morning some cultural norms that affect cultures. Because it's really important that we grasp that before we can understand how we can build a culture of commitment. You see, every culture has a set of norms that are formed by a worldview or worldviews that define normal behavior. And so we have a set of behaviors as a culture here in Australia that we consider to be normal, but they won't always line up with what is considered to be normal in other countries. In other words, in a developing third world country, or should I say two-thirds of the world, there will be a different set of cultural norms to what we have here in Australia. These are often in a developing Eastern context, there will be a different realm of normality and behavior than what there is in a capitalistic culture such as ours. And so if we're going to understand worldviews and cultures, then we've got to drill into this a little bit. If we're to move beyond agreeing that commitment to Christ, his church and his cause is essential to actually living out that commitment, then it's going to require change on all our behalves. And it'll probably require a paradigm shift. That was the Luke 14 scripture that I neglected to put up. And the paradigm shift is defined basically as a fundamental change in our underlying worldview. So when people go through a paradigm shift where their worldview changes, that's called a paradigm shift. And, um, and that's how it works. And so a paradigm shift can be painful. It can be uh, stretching. It's going to mess with our compass, with our moral compass. It's like if you hold the plumb line like that, it'll feel like it's going at 90 degrees to your hand. And so cultures contain certain expectations. Again, as I said before, Australians once had an expectation of leaving school, marrying, having 2.3 kids, a mortgage, a good job. We valued the unique differences between girls and boys, and we formed uh, values around freedom of expression. If we didn't agree with someone else, we would sometimes have a blue, we might call them a silly bugger, and we'd move on. That's Australian culture. That's the way it was, right down to the language. We settled our differences over a beer or two, and we moved on. That's typical Australian culture. Nobody here behaves that way, of course. But when, then we are atypical of the culture. But Australian culture is currently going through a once-in, a multi-generational paradigm shift. There's a revolution taking place. And we can either be spectators of the revolution, or we can be uh, agitators, we can be people that stir it up and want it to move faster, or we can be resistors, we can be people that say, hang on, just put the brakes on, this is all happening too fast. And have we really thought this thing through in any case? And so there's a culture war taking place in Australia at the moment. It's happening all around the world. But in our culture, it's happening at an ever-increasing rate. We've just elected a government in Victoria. Is there any Victorians in the room? Just as well. We've just elected a government in Victoria that is openly boasting about being the most progressive government in Australia. And their boast is based on things like uh, safe schools. Now, that's a total misnomer, by the way. It's based on things um, that revolve around ignoring gender and things like that. I don't know how a government can get in who spends a billion dollars on a road that doesn't exist. And yet that's what's happened. And I don't often talk about politics, so it's going to become more topical. You know, the bottom line is we can't avoid politics. It's going to be the topical thing of the next age. And we've got to be switched on. And so what will be happening in the lead up to the federal election is that there is a small group of Christian leaders, a very small group of Christian leaders in Adelaide, that will be producing some um, helps for Christians on how to vote. 
And um, it, it'll be non-partisan. We won't be looking at parties. We'll be looking at individual candidates and we'll be looking at their voting performance in the past and how they intend to vote in the future. And what we intend to do is to inform the church. And so we're probably going to be accused of being political, blah, 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 blah. The word politics, by the way, means affairs of the city. So any Christian that believes we shouldn't be involved in the, in the affairs of the city hasn't really read the book. Because that's what being a Christian is all about, isn't it? And so in Australian culture, we are going through a revolution and we have to be involved in it. We will take one of those three positions, but we must be involved in it. The culture war is ramping up. And in this war, the freedoms that we once took for granted are under assault. Traditional institutions that have formed our culture are being eroded or torn down. And our culture is changing, mostly not for good. So we're seeing this thing play out before our eyes. Everybody that's got a television or an internet connection can see it. Anyone who talks to people in the street, you can see it. Cultural paradigm shifts are usually painful and divisive. And so it's no wonder that what we're seeing in Australian politics at the moment is reflecting that. It's becoming very painful, very divisive. People are becoming very divided on lots of issues. But you see, this is not, this has much, many precedents in the scripture. There's nothing new about this. It is a once in multi-generational change, but then that happened often in scripture as well. One good example is when God gave the promised land to the Israelites. Now the land was occupied by the Canaanites. You probably remember the story in, from Sunday school if, if you had the privilege of being in Sunday school. And so God ordered the Israelites to go into the promised land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land. And I, I read that story and I've read it for years and I go, why do we want to know this? This is just bloodthirsty, horrible behavior. Exhibits all the worst of humanity and it shows the world that we have a God that likes blood. At least that's what I've been thinking. But I'm starting to see the meaning of this scripture. And I think our culture highlights it, helps us to see why some of these difficult scriptures are there. Now we've got to remember that there's a cultural setting again that existed 4,000 years ago that doesn't exist now. And so you settled issues by killing people. You know, if you had an argument, you lost, you're dead. Game over. That's the way it worked. We don't do that now. We have a beer and we call them a silly bugger and move on, like I said before. Now, certainly in our thinking, this seems like a harsh way to change cultural norms. But what it shows us is how difficult it's going to be from here on in to begin to change the culture. And you might wonder, what's this got to do with commitment? All will be revealed. Just hang in. But what can we say, what can we see, I should say, through the eviction of the Canaanites from the Promised Land? I believe we can see lots of keys that help us understand what's happening here today. And it also shows that there's a necessity of extreme action when initiating serious cultural change. In order to usher in a new culture, it shows us that the old culture must be mercilessly destroyed. Now this works on a flip, on a coin. It works two ways, and I'm going to just unpack that a little bit now. There's a strong illusion, or should I say illustration, of the power of cultural norms and worldviews that comes through scriptures like this. The Israelites couldn't, couldn't afford any shred of the depravity of the Canaanites to remain in the land when they, as they occupied it. There had to be change. So let's pick the story up in Joshua chapter 6 from verse 16. Remember the story where they, mar they marched around Jericho and the walls fell down. And it says, the seventh time around, when the priests sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies we sent. Verse 18, but keep 
away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise you will make a camp, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and the, at the sound of the trumpet, the men gave a loud shout and the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in and they took the city. Verse 21. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep and donkeys. Now to our culture, that's offensive. The very notion that women and children would be, would be destroyed. But what we can understand through this is that there was so much going on in this city or in this nation that was being overtaken by Israel that it had to be brought to a complete close. We can learn a lot about what's happening in our culture today by understanding this passage. The truth is those that are waging war on our culture are seeking to destroy the old culture mercilessly. That's one way of looking at it. The trigger that was pulled through uh, legalizing gender-neutral marriage, for instance, has released a violent and destructive force that's now taking hold of our nation. It's happening with men, women and children and it's designed to purge our culture of all the norms that we've valued. And in the process of that, blood is being shed. And it may not be literal blood, but it's blood nonetheless. It seems that the enemy has in fact read the memo. The memo. He has the manual on how to bring cultural change. The enemy has understood passages like Joshua 6 and the church has shied away from it because it offends us. But the enemy's taken hold of it and the enemy is occupying the land and destroying the inhabitants, which happened to be you and I. At least that's the plan. And so if we understand the principles of the fall of Jericho, there is hope that we can change our own culture. And this is a culture of indifference because the church has got used to things like is happening in the world today and we've kind of adjusted. We've melded around it, we've allowed things to happen and we've adapted to whatever change has come. But you see, if we understand the principles of the fall of Jericho, there's hope that we can change our culture. We're now living in a church culture that has existed for generations. And it's not been a great thing. It has modelled something that is probably not ideal. And in many respects, we've allowed what's happening in the world to take place without even a whimper. Because we haven't realised the gravity of it. The enemy got the memo and we haven't read it. And so again, there's going to be a high cost of commitment. This is what this whole series is all about. There is a paradigm shift that's required in you and I in order to change. It's not going to be easy. Um, the passage in uh, Joshua 6 is interesting because the one family that was spared was the, the household of Rahab, the prostitute. The most unlikely person, isn't it amazing, throughout scripture, how often that happens. The most unlikely person ends up being the champion. But the thing is, Rahab the prostitute was able to make a paradigm shift. She was able to see what was going on. She could see the contrast between good and evil. The rest of them didn't have a hope. And they were put to the sword and done away with. But Rahab and her household survived because they were able to make a paradigm shift. And so that's the good news for us. Because what it means is none of us need to perish. None of us needs to be caught up in the culture. None of us needs to bend our knee and when God comes to have to explain what's going on. Because we've got the memo. We've got the scripture. We have the manual. We can understand what's going on. And so what it shows us as a church culture, and I'm speaking to us as a church, but to churches broadly, it means that we must be intentionally ruthless against 
the enemies of commitment. Because much of the church is not committed to anything. We're not committed to Jesus, his church and his cause. We're committed to having an easy life and accommodating because that's what we've been taught to do. And so we're going to have to become incredibly and intentionally ruthless against all the enemies of commitment if we're going to see change. This can't come simply as a series of teachings or a bunch of directives from people like me or Deb or anybody, any other leader. It can only come when we are prepared to utterly destroy all the enemies of commitment. And I'm not talking about people. We can leave no trace in, the, in this process. We must leave no trace of laziness, laziness, apathy or indifference. But we've got to be ruthless to purge the land of those things. Now I'm speaking uh, quite abstractly at the moment, but you'll get it. Some of these enemies will be personal to each of us and others will be common to Southland culture. And so I'm looking at us specifically here. If we want to have a high commitment culture, then let me tell you, my friends, it's going to get bloody. There's going to be deaths. There's going to be sacrifice. And that's the way it must be because that's the way the manual reads. This is not the only example of that kind of thing taking place in Scripture, by the way. Whenever there is a paradigm shift, whenever there's a cultural change in Scripture, there's always a dying of the old. Remember when the Israelites came out of Egypt and the first thing they did when Moses went to, to receive the law is that they got off into all sorts of things and they started worshipping a golden calf and Moses came down and you know all heaven broke loose. The earth opened up and had them for lunch. It was pretty drastic measures. And that generation marched or should I say wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until every last person had died off. Again, it's exactly the same principle. If you want to see the change of a culture, there has to be death. Everything's got to die. All the old has to die before the new can start to arise. And so there's many examples in Scripture where complete generations are just taken out so that something else new can start up. And yet it doesn't have to be that way. So in both those examples, the first one, Rahab, was a survivor. More than that, she was a conqueror. And secondly, in the second example, there was a small group of people, the Joshuas of the place, who went through those times and then went into the promised land because God chose to preserve them because of the attitudes in their hearts. And so it's possible for any of us to survive the onslaught of a paradigm shift in the culture. We can do it. The worst thing we can do is to conform with the world right now. It's the worst thing we can do. We must be different. We must be salt and light. We must stand out. We must be seen and we must be heard. And if it means being involved in politics, then we need to do it. I would love it if we had people in this room as candidates on our local councils. I would love it if you stood for, for state election. It's probably going to cost you a lot of money to do that. But I believe God will raise up people in the church who have a heart to do that. And we mustn't be ashamed of it. It's not so much the partisanness of the politics. It's more the cause itself. Because the very values of the Christian ethos are, are in play here. And if we don't fight for them, they're going to disappear. And so it's important that we do this. So how do, we build, how do we build foundations of commitment? Well, the foundations for cultural, a cultural change to commitment are built when we launch and maintain a full-on offensive against the inhabitants of the land. Again, these are not people. The inhabitants, inhabitants of the lands are the carriers of the culture. These are the entities that carry our cultural identity. In our case, we're not shedding the blood of people, but we're ruthlessly destroying thoughts, attitudes, and behaviors, beginning with us, beginning with you and I. Something has to change in us. You know, the worst thing that can happen to our culture is that the church does nothing. I believe, I strongly believe, 
that we are still the only hope of this world, as, as Rick Warren says. We are the only hope of this world. And in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3, everybody will probably know this passage from verse 3. It says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. In other words, we're not trying to take people out here. This is, a, this is an operation on attitudes. Verse 4, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience. Once your obedience is complete, that's us. He's talking to us here. And so the strongholds in our culture are clear. Their arguments, their pretensions or false claims. I mean, we're, society is full of this stuff. Politics is rife with false, false claims, unsubstantiated statements, and we need to hold our politicians accountable. Thoughts, our own thoughts. We choose to go off in different areas and, and not think about the bad things, just ignore them and they'll go away. Well, it doesn't work quite that easily, unfortunately. Acts of disobedience. You see, one day, every one of us is going to stand before God. And he's going to judge us. He's going to judge the church. Now, hopefully, that's going to be good news. Because judgment isn't just a negative emotion. Judgment also judges you to be a winner. And I believe that in most cases, that's going to be the case. God's not angry with us. His default setting is that he loves every one of us and he wants us the very best for us. And you know what? This 70 or 80 or 90 or, sorry, June, 100 years. She's not 100 yet, but she, and, but she only looks 25, don't you, June? I, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. We only have a limited amount of time on earth is the illustration. That's, that's the deal. But you know what? This is such an important time in history for us because it defines the rest of eternity. The decisions we make now affect the rest of our eternity. And so it's so important that we're not in acts of disobedience. There's such a short time for us to get this thing right. Everything we do now has an eternal effect. A culture of commitment is passionately defined and doesn't simply drift with the culture or merge into it and become part of it. We can't afford to do that. You know, for too often, the church has had an obsession with being relevant. For too often, we've tried to play the game of the world in order to get people into the church, and it hasn't worked. It'll never work. It's not the way it's designed to be. We're called to a life of irrelevance. We're called to be peculiar. We're called to be different. We're called to be salt and light. We're called to stand out. And yet we've had this kind of thing where we hide and hedge and we don't talk about this and that in case we offend somebody. It's got to stop. We can't keep doing that. We've got to get real. I love what Paul says in Romans 12. And this is all part of the foundation of building a culture of commitment. He says, love must be sincere Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal. Now, what is zeal if it's not commitment? But keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with God's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. It's like he's reading the world's mail. Do not repay evil with evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. 
On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So what Paul's talking about here isn't just a list of instructions that we fit into a busy life. Paul here is defining the DNA of a culture. He's speaking to the very heart of our existence. And if we're going to get to the place that he's defining here, it's going to require an incredible cultural change. There will be pain, there will be turmoil, we're going to find out who our enemies are and who our friends are. But this is the culture that God wants us to set. And I think, it's, I think this is totally relevant to the church because we're in the midst of something now that's really starting to show us the difference between dark and light. There's a separation taking place such that has never happened before in history. And so that's, that's the foundation of commitment. It's a cultural DNA level change that needs to take place that will take full commitment of all of us. And once we get to that place, how do we maintain it? Well, commitment is very much a personal deal. And it always comes back to the individual. We can't commit, you can't commit, I can't commit to someone else's convictions. We have to have a conviction ourselves in our own hearts. Because true unity comes when we all discover that we're heading in the same direction through the work of hard commitment. When we make a commitment to something and we take off in that direction as an individual, then we look sideways and see that there's a whole bunch of people heading in the same direction. That's where commitment comes. And that's where it's maintained. Because what happens in that situation is we discover something that's worth dying for and living for. There's always a flip side. There are basically a few ways that we can do this, and I just want to finish off with these if we want to ma maintain commitment. Firstly, we've got to learn to get our mindset right. Again, these are all scriptural. Our mindset, the way we think, the way we process information. Again, Paul says in Romans 12 too, do not conform. Now those words on their own sets us apart, doesn't it? Because instantly God's saying here, we are in a sense to be divisive. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Now there's pain in that statement. Because the moment we are non-conforming, we're going to draw all the enemy's fire. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew the mind? Well, you do it through this thing, not the iPad, the content, which is the scripture. We conform and we, we renew our minds through the word of God. The word of God washes our mind and cleanses us, renews us and helps us to see things as they really are. So that's the first step. Goes on to say, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, ple pleasing and perfect will. Because it's the only, only the word of God shows the will of God without any spin. We, as a church, we value prophecy. But prophecy in isolation doesn't reveal the word of God or his will. Prophecy is like an, ex an extra added bonus. It speaks to the moment. It speaks to our present situation. And so prophecy plus the word is a very powerful thing. But it all starts with the word of God. Our minds need to be cleansed. And we need to start thinking differently. That's actually the definition of repentance. So that's the first thing, getting our mindset right. The second thing is setting appropriate goals and then sticking to them. And so without goal close, we're not going to win the game, are we? I mean, and again, that's part of the culture today. Our children are taught that you, you, know, you participate, you play the game, it doesn't matter whether you win or not. And, and I understand the stuff behind that. But we're raising up a bunch of children now that don't know how to win. That's the problem with that thinking. And commitment thrives on having clearly defined goals and then winning. And so we've got to teach our children to win. That's going to change. It's going to bring us into conflict with the world because we're living in a world that says, don't tell children they have to win, they just have to be. Well, 
what are they going to be? They're not going to be a girl or a boy. There's, apparently now there's 20 genders. So they can be anything they want, I guess. As believers in Christ, we must know our goals and play hard to win the game. There is no other way to do this thing. Again, Paul says it here in Philippians. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So God sees us this morning as winners. We're either winners, we're either winning, or we're in the process of winning, or we're potential winners. But there's no losers in the church. God wants us to win the game. And in winning the game, there's going to be bruises and bumps and scratches. Reputations are put on the line. All sorts of things take place that we may not find comfortable. But that's what winning's about. You see, part of the cultural change I'm talking about is getting us used to winning again. We're not used to winning. We're used to coming second. Or we're used to not participating. We're used to letting someone else win. But God wants us to be winners. And if we're going to change the culture, we have to learn to win. So that's very important. Number three, if we're going to maintain a culture um, that is a winning culture, then we have to also be accountable. And again, being accountable is a commitment. Because being accountable says we may have enemies out there, but we need to have friends here or wherever our spiritual home is. We need to be accountable and that is an imperative. It's absolutely imperative to staying on course with commitment. Because without that kind of accountability, without having friends around us that are constantly encouraging us and sometimes saying, have you thought about what you just did? It probably wasn't that helpful. We need those kinds of people. That's why church is so important. Because accountability isn't just a defensive position. And we've often painted the picture with accountability that it's something that kind of protects us from the evil one. And it is that. But accountability is more than something that's defensive. Accountability is an offensive. Again, the church is called to an offensive game. We're not called to a defensive game. We're called to purge the land of all the inhabitants in the spiritual realm that are bringing destruction. You see, we take no prisoners. We mustn't entertain thoughts that are in contrary to the scripture. Commitment to this level will require incredible accountability, not as an, as an offensive option, but as a, a fully offensive part of our game. Accountability should be leaned into. In other words, you don't lay back and watch. Accountability is the kind of thing that happens when we get involved. We lean into it and we're part of the game. It happens when we become interdependent, when we're looking out for each other, and when we're going for the, for the ball hard, if you think of it as a game of football. Again, there's a scripture, and I'm going to finish off with this one in Proverbs, that says, iron sharpens iron. There, I had it there. And so one man sharpens another. Now, iron doesn't get sharpened in a, in a passive way. I remember in the old days watching my dad, we used to, so we didn't have the butcher shop so much like we have nowadays, but you did, but it was expensive. And uh, growing up with four boys that love meat, my dad had to learn to butcher. And so every few weeks, he used, we used to go drive out to a farm of a friend that we had and we'd pick out the sheep that we wanted to have for, for dinner that night. It wasn't quite that quick because you've got to let them hang for a few days after you kill them. And we'd take them home and there'd be two or three little kids sitting around dad watching him butcher a sheep. It was a beautiful thing. <laughs> but what I learned through that process is it's a horrible thing if you try to do it with a blunt knife. And so my dad had the most incredibly sharp knives, butcher's knives. And he would spend ages with a big, long steel, that long. Now you can get the ones that are diamond coated, so it's a lot easier. And he'd just work on this thing until you could drop a piece of paper on it and it went 
just separated. And then when he butchered the sheep, it actually was a beautiful thing. He'd cut through and the, the chops would just roll off. Or if it was a, a, um, a cow, it's not a cow, but a steer, uh, the steaks would just roll off beautifully. So it was a beautiful thing. But, and so you can't do that unless you have a sharp knife. And guys, our job here as a church is to keep each other sharp, to support each other as we go out and do these things. And again, let's think about who, could, who can stand for Parliament. I'm sure there are people here in this room that could be a part of the solution that we could get behind. I'm not suggesting a political overthrow, but I am suggesting that we get involved. Now, I've spent a lot of time recently writing to politicians. I've had face-to-face -face meetings just recently with three different senators, not to mention uh, people in opposition. I've written to all parties and asked their opinions on the important issues. And those that have given me the wrong answer, I've come back to them and said, I'm sorry, I can't vote for you, based on your convictions. And if we all do that, we can cause a revolution. But unfortunately, the church is not doing it. We're just sitting down and letting the world dictate the terms. So in a sense, we're trying to live in a land run by Canaanites. Something to think about. So the kind of commitment I'm talking about this morning is a cultural commitment, is a commitment for the culture of the church to stand up and show ourselves as we are. Time to stop hiding. So why don't we stand together?